Hello and welcome to Upfront. I'm your host, Leanne Evans. On today's show, we'll be welcoming our federal member of parliament for Cardston, Warner and Medicine Hat, Glenn Motts. We're here on Upfront with MP Glenn Motts. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you uh, for inviting me back again, Leanne. Yes, this is your second time on our show. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I just want to ask, um, you were in the police force for 35 years. Um, how has it been transitioning from that role now into federal politics? You know, I, as I was, I guess, looking inside myself to see whether or not this is something that I have the capacity to do or the skill sets to do, I was reminded about what policing is really about. And policing is about advocating for those who don't have a voice. Um, working with individuals and with community to, you know, uh, affect change. Helping individuals solve problems. I think policing in the years that I had and the opportunities I had in that environment were great training grounds to be a representative, to train to be a representative, because that's what a member of parliament really is. It's to represent the people that uh, had the confidence to, you know, to vote for you and to be their voice in Ottawa. And so a lot of what we do on a daily basis in our office is not what you see in QP or, or the committee work, and that's important, don't get me wrong, and that's a, that's a different aspect, but the constituency office here on a daily basis is, is you know, over and over and over again, we're dealing with immigration issues, we're dealing with uh, Canada Revenue Agency issues, we're dealing with OAS issues, CPP issues, um, you know, issues of regulation that, you know, they need an interpretation on or they need some help with, and so, what I really enjoy is hearing the success stories um, from my own staff who have helped somebody who otherwise were, were at a dead end. Uh, they were set to be, you know, um, removed from the country or uh, they were dead ended with a CRA issue and because of our access to, in a different way of accessing, we're able to, to positively impact their life. And uh, I really enjoyed that. The other night at an event uh, I was at, I had a lady come up to me and speak of Dave, one of the one of the young gentlemen in my office, and spoke about how he was helping her through her issue, and how so appreciative she was. She's I was at my wit's end, I had lost hope, and he re-encouraged me, and um, it's what's what had taken months uh, with no response. He was able to get back to her within a couple of days and and start getting some resolution to her issue. Those are the things that I like to do. And it reminds me of what we did in policing where you go and you help someone solve that immediate problem. And um, it doesn't matter the political stripe that they come from or the background that they have. It's, it's what you do. You're here to represent all people, uh, irregardless of, of whether they voted for you or not. And um, I, I love hearing those stories. Unfortunately, I don't get to do the actual work. Mm -hmm. They do, and they do it so well and uh, to hear those things back from the public that it made a difference to them and their family, uh, that's, that's, that's it for me. So I guess it kind of goes hand in hand I, with the police work and uh, helping with the politics. You mm. are helping people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, when you watch Question Period <laughs> or you see some of the decisions made through government, we might wonder whether we're really helping people. But, um, you know, I, yeah, we're, the responsibility of, of an elected official is to um, ensure you you are the voice of the people that you represent and um, you know on, on, like we talked earlier about uh, the economic issues facing our riding um, those things you have to be a voice of reason and and and, um, and so you know you stand up and you you take a stand and you voice your issues on committee and uh, you know you 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 present the positions of people from your riding, uh, how, how this decision is impacting them or has the potential to impact them. You give them true stories of the impacts of those. And it, it, I, I think it's, we've seen some 
some things changed because of MPs doing that, and I, I, I enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Now, um, you were in a leadership role with the police service, and you were able to implement change, but now going into the uh, House of Commons, do you find it somewhat frustrating how long it takes mm -hmm. to get things kind of done? I, I do. I, you know, what's interesting is uh, days after we had won the nomination, uh, Mr. Jason Kenney was still a member of parliament before he, he switched his, his focus. He phoned me up and he says, you know, uh, Glenn, based on what I've read about you and what I've been told about you, you're going to be extremely frustrated in Ottawa. And I said, why? He says, things don't move at the pace with which you have become accustomed to in your life. And that is very, very true. Uh, not only from uh, a government uh, policy uh, you know, legislation perspective, but also, but also in the bureaucratic side, you know, m navigating all the rules and nuances of, of, you know, they interpret something this way and, and they can't think outside the box and, um, you know, to, to affect change is a slow, slow process because it, not just you and I can affect change at that level, you need the whole committees that have to decide on whether this is good, what impact that is because it has, it has, uh, you know, national, um, excuse me, national impact on some of these things that, that you're dealing with. So yeah, I can understand why some of the things are slow, but that has been a frustrating process. It is slow. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first time you walked in there mm. in the House of Commons, uh, what was your feelings? Was it like, I'm here and I'm ready to do this, or it, did you have some nerves? <laughs> what was interesting is, um, uh, I was I was sworn in on the 14th of November, and you're not able to enter the house mm -hmm. until you're sworn in, and then you have to be led into the house, and the speaker has to read in and on, put on record that I have met the obligations as set out in the acts, and that I'm now I'm now qualified, I guess, or or confirmed to take my rightful seat, and so. Um, you know, I, I had done my swearing in on the, six, on the 14th, and on the 16th, I was led into the house for the very first time. And if you ever see that, if you, if you watch the video on Facebook uh, uh, of that actual event, um, I was incredibly moved by that moment. Um, Ron, uh, Ron Ambrose, or the, the official leader, or the, uh, the leader of the official opposition, who was so gracious, we were standing outside the doors of the House of Commons, and, um, you know, she had my arm and she says, Glenn, just so you know, um, this will be the only, the only time your name will be mentioned in the House of Commons in history other than if you cast a vote. And so I didn't know the significance of that. But, mm -hmm. the, you know, you never address each other that way. And then mm -hmm. walking in, um, every member of that House of Commons, uh, irregardless of their, their partisanship, stood and I mean, they clapped like crazy, and it was it, it was a little overwhelming. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, but yeah. they they were so welcoming, and it was, you know, we're going to have the same thing happen for the five by elections that we have coming up, right. uh, you know, uh, in, on April third. And when those people walk in uh, to see them and 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 to do that, to stand in front of the the mace and have uh, Miss Ambrose read to on record and to the speaker it confirmed. And, you know, to take my seat at that point in time to a continuous standing ovation, uh, the enormity of that responsibility hit me at that moment. And then, of course, rather than giving the opportunity to rest on that, they had me ask a question <laughs> in my first moments in the house. So that was a little, little nerve-wracking. But it, it, was, it was great. And, you know, and after that was all done, and you're just kind of, take a breath and soak it in. I had a very seasoned MP come up to me and he says, you know, Glenn, just so you put this in perspective, in all of Canadian history, less than 5,000 people have sat in this house. Wow. That was overwhelming that, you know, that people have entrusted me to do that. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm honored. Well, you gave me chills there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll be back after the break.
Well, welcome back to Upfront. Um, all right, so you're a man of deep convictions that you had mentioned earlier. So how do you put that aside when you have to make a vote or when you have people in your riding that may think differently? Um, it isn't always easy. And I, I think what I would have done is I've, I've asked for wisdom from many other people on, on how they deal with this. And um, what, what's incredible is each of us, whether we admit it or not, um, our, our decisions, our belief systems uh, are based on our own convictions, whether they are faith related or not. And, and so we arrive at conclusions based on those things. So there, there will be and there is issues that are, you know, that, that you know, the government deals with that are convictions of mine. And when it comes to matters of deep conviction, um, I believe that my responsibility is to um, use my deep conviction and use that as, as my position. And I base that on a number of things. One, I've had individuals tell me in the writing that they disagree with me on a position, but they respect the fact that I have a position. I'm not afraid to articulate it, and I don't have to always agree or they don't have to always agree with me. My purpose for doing it would be a longer term benefit to Canadians for making a decision based on my convictions, based on what I believe, based on what I think is best for the majority of our population. Not everybody has to agree, and it's okay. It's okay to, to disagree. Um, and so that's kind of how I've, how I've approached this. And there has been some things that, you know, that we've, we've had to look at. And, uh, um, you know, there was one issue, unfortunately, that I, I was away from the house when it occurred. But um, moving forward, that's, I mean, I, I do have some, some deep-seated convictions and people I was up front with them all along. Um, you know, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to speak my convictions and I'm not afraid to listen to opposing views. It's okay, it's healthy, debate is healthy. Not everybody's gonna agree, like you said. Yep. Okay, uh, so you had, um, I guess, shown that you are very supportive of the WINS law. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah, um, right no. Do you want to explain what it is and sure. why you're so behind it? Um, in 2015, January of 2015, uh, Constable David Wynn uh, was killed by someone he was trying to arrest in St. Albert, Alberta. Um, the individual that he was trying to arrest was out on bail. He had um, 50 previous convictions and 30 outstanding, 30 plus outstanding charges before the courts. In this particular circumstance, what was uh, unfortunate is that the last uh, bail process did not bring in any of that individual's criminal record to be adjudicated by the justice deciding whether this, whether bail should be granted. And I'm positive and I'm confident that had the justice had that information, he would have uh, kept that individual in custody. And so um, Shelley Wynn, um, Constable, the late Constable David Wynn's uh, widow, uh, we have met on a number of occasions, just a delightful lady who's fighting for this, for not only closure for her family, so that, but no, so no other law enforcement family or no other Canadian is faced with it. And the whole premise is we can change a section in the criminal code on bail that says that a justice not, uh, you know, may hear a person's criminal record, but shall hear. One word. And it changes. So on a bail hearing, the justice will, as, as part of his requirement, or the, her requirement, ask for that information. What is this person's previous record? So um, uh, my colleague Michael Cooper, the MP from uh, Edmonton, St. Albert, uh, was a driving force behind this. It came through the Senate and he took it on in the House and uh, last week we had a, a you know a, a mini victory or a great victory in the first stage is to have it passed in the House to go to committee to study. So it was a very emotional moment um, you know we, we, we spoke to a lot of common sense uh, people from across the country and got some ideas on this and pushed it hard 
And, and we were pleased that 25 liberals, or about 25 liberal MPs, supported us in this. And we had talked to many of them and, and had them see the impact of this and that it wasn't going to be a burden on our, on our justice system. And, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a good first step. And so I was very passionate about, about, uh, about that and, and was happy to partner with uh, Michael. I spoke on it in the House one day. Um, I, I gave a 10-minute presentation or thereabouts on it and answered questions in the House about why it's important that our justice system be reflective of this particular change. Now, do you feel that um, you're so passionate about it because of your history in the police service? Y yeah, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I went to, I went to David's funeral. Uh, mm -hmm. The chief, Chief McGrogan, and I uh, attended his funeral, and uh, uh, I saw Shelley there. I saw her young boys there. Um, we can all feel the senselessness of that, and knew the struggle she'd have moving forward. And so, um, at that moment, I remember coming back with the chief. We traveled together and talking about, if only they, if only they would, you know make that provision mm -hmm. well guess what I'm now part of the they and uh, I'm going to take those opportunities to stand up for what we believe in the safety of Canadians and I bet that's pretty powerful now being that they yeah you know, having that drive back and saying if only yeah if mm -hmm. only you know uh, and another example I you know I uh, I was I was honored to host um, the uh, you know uh, social development human services uh, or human resource special uh, people with special needs um, committee a federal a standing federal committee in medicine I think it's the first time that we've had one and so they heard about the things that were happening in medicine not because of me but because of rep medicine reputation on poverty reduction and on housing and homelessness so that you know the community done a great has done a great job of that and so to host them here but I remember as we were leading up to it and I attended one of their one of their committee meetings and I spoke of my experience on the housing board and at the food bank and in policing for all these years and seeing people marginalized and fall through the cracks and wondering with my own policing colleagues as well as social agency colleagues and say if only they would have thought about this in this legislation if only they would think of this in funding and so I, I addressed the committee and there was you know 10 or 12 of us around the table and I said you know folks we are they we have an opportunity now to get this right mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to affect change in people's lives for generations to come let's not drop the ball on this and so being in that position is incredibly incredibly important to recognize the impact that sound commonsensical reasonable um, approaches to trying to better the lives of Canadians can have and it's you know sometimes this committee has been great because it's not you know, you know there's there's it's a liberal dominated committee but in most things we can agree that we're trying to make life better for many Canadians who find themselves in a tough spot absolutely all right well we'll have lots more coming up after this Welcome back to Upfront with Glenn Motts. Uh, now, you were talking earlier about the standing committee here in Medicine mm -hmm. Hat. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, this uh, it's called HUMA for short, and uh, this committee, the standing committee, was here. And um, what we did is we um, we interviewed or we had witnesses give testimony here in Medicine Hat uh, from housing, from from the city, um, you know. From from food banks, you know, you know we, we had a we had a, a great great uh, group of individuals who provided their perspectives. Um, um, education was there, the college was there, um, so they provided their perspective on how we can deal with poverty reduction and homelessness and things like that. Great pieces of information. I know the committee was thrilled, and they've done six centers across Canada. Um, Medicine Hat was one of those. So what a great testament to our community that mm -hmm. they were uh, on the cutting edge of what can make a difference to impact people's lives positively. That report um, from the committee, as I understand it, should be out in early May sometime. And uh, we, we, I'm looking forward to seeing what that, what that is like on a way forward with that. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to completely change topics here so uh, we want to, the Liberals are planning on legalizing marijuana so uh, we want to know what your thoughts are 
Um, I'm troubled. I'm troubled by this. I think all we need to do is learn from jurisdictions who have done this before. Washington State, um, Colorado have instituted legalization and it has not gone according to plan, especially when you talk to the people that act, they oper actually have to operationalize this. Um, there, and I, I, just, I just heard this last week, the impaired driving or, or deaths caused by marijuana related impaired driving doubled in Washington state or tripled and quadrupled in Colorado. So that, there, there's my number one concern is public safety. Um, plus, irregardless of what, I mean, what is being said, doctors tell us, science tells us that we have to absolutely keep this away from children. Uh, and it, it's, it's de developmentally damaging to them. If it's that much more readily available than it is today, will that cause us as a society some concerns moving forward? The costs to managing this is is huge uh, the health costs uh, because marijuana is not as um, uh, you know it, it's it's toxic like cigarettes or worse it, you know it has health concerns um, now I think the liberal government is realizing that to use legalizing marijuana as a ploy to get votes and now the reason it's taken them so long is there are some huge issues that have to be dealt with in order to make sure this is done right. I'm opposed to it, but it appears as if we're going down this path anyway. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some regulated um, rollout of this. It has to be federally regulated. You can't dump this on the provinces. You have to put strict regulations in with respect to access and quantity and, um, you know, things of that nature. I mean, the, the, the Canadian Chiefs of Police have, have advocated for a number of years now of decriminalizing small quantity possession. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a reasonable approach to bridge a gap that there, there seems to be. So, um, you know, it's, it's a conversation that we probably don't have time for to talk and talk and talk about, but I personally am opposed. I think, it'll, I think it'll has some societal, uh, it, it will have some societal repercussions and uh, uh, may actually cost us more in the end, both financially and in other way, and, and the cost of uh, the loss of lives. All right. So, in closing, um, I do want to ask: with your time in federal politics, what is your end goal? Would you like to, you know, have mentored somebody to get into it, or um, you know, what is the outcome that you would love to have? <laughs> I think. Um, I think in life, uh, it's great to have a purpose. It's great to, to do things beyond yourself. And so um, when this is all done for me, uh, I think a measure of success for me would be that we made a difference for people here. Um, we ensured that those who needed a voice had a voice and could depend on us. We don't have to dis we don't have to agree on everything, but they know they were always heard, and that um, people would remain engaged. I think sometimes our society dis disengages from politics, and in this country, we have a unique opportunity to have a say and a voice in how we want to live our life. And um, you know, to when I leave, I'd like this riding to be strongly. Uh, represented uh, and a strong uh, people in our community who are who are anxious to uh, to stand up and defend uh, you know the conservative values of things that have made the conservative party great all right well we appreciate your time here today thank you very much Lynn. again for your second episode <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's all we have for today thanks for watching and we'll see you next time right here on upfront